it's a pleasure to uh, for Michel to introduce Federico. Academics should better understand how the world works. Okay, so that's the research. We should, as academics, help students, you know, well, well, people here, understand how the world works. Academics should also have impact on society. That's impact on how companies operate and should have impact on how policy decisions are being taken. So basically, what we are trying to do when we are choosing recipients of this honoris causa professorships is to honor scholars who have significant contributions in most, if not all, of those dimensions. <coughs> so we are talking about academic research, we are talking about teaching, we are talking about implications on companies, corporate implications, we are talking about policy implications. And basically my introduction, I'm just going to spend a few minutes, not more than this, because I mean, uh, the person whose words we are waiting for, it's not me, it's Federico, uh, but just to let you know about why we decided to grant this uh, Professor Honoris Cosa to Federico. Let's talk of, uh, start about with the academic research. Sciences, all sciences, whether it's hard sciences, social sciences, management, progress the same way. Science progressed as an interplay of theory and evidence. Because in hard sciences, there is the possibility of what we call controlled experiments, lab experiments, where you can try to keep all parameters constant and just change one and see what happens. And this is a very efficient, very effective way to test theories. This is, however, more difficult in social sciences in general, and in particular in macroeconomics. When you're talking about entire countries, I mean, you cannot keep all other variables as constant and just change one policy variable. Because of this, because of this difficulty, I mean, this impossibility of having controlled experiments, uh, there is disagreement about facts. Disagreements about facts lead to disagreement about theories, Disagreement about theories lead about disagreement about policies. And this is one reason why macroeconomics, the field that uh, Federico contributed to, is a field where there is still now lots of disagreement. Okay? So the contribution of Federico has been uh, in the dimension of trying to get the facts straight, try to improve our understanding about facts. I'm going to give two examples one about national income accounting and one about exchange rate regimes. I'm going to be very brief because I believe Federico is going to talk again about this and that since this is his work, he's a lot more competent to talk about it than I am. National income accounting. Simple accounting, not theory here. Just accounting suggests that when you have current account deficits, that is, I mean, one way of having it is that if you consume more than you earn, then your net foreign assets are going to go down, and therefore your investment income is supposed to go down. This seems simple accounting. Except that when you look at the evidence, you see a number of puzzling facts. For instance, US up to the mid 2000s accumulated huge current account deficits, but you did not see uh, investment income going down sharply, actually, it remained fairly stable. So this started some work of Federico with Ricardo Hausmann from Harvard University, where they tried to reconcile those facts and to actually argue that there was some severe mismeasurement issues, what they call dark matters. And this had some stark implications. I mean, for instance, I mean, something as basic as a fairly big country, China, I mean, whether in quite a number of years, let's say early 2000s, whether it was a net debtor or a net creditor. It looks like a trivial question. But actually, I mean, Federico's research suggested that the answer was not trivial. Second example, exchange rate regimes. Most people here, at some point of their lives, took a macroeconomics 101 course. Well, you have seen, I mean, some things like ISLM, whatever. Uh, and then the world as it was described in macroeconomics 101 seemed very simple. There was two possible regimes. Either you had a fixed rate regime or floating uh, exchange rate regimes. Okay, so that's the textbook cases. Sad fact of life, real world is often uh, quite different from textbooks. 
Uh, in particular, I mean, there is fixed rates, there is floating rate, but in reality, there is many different intermediate regimes. And to complicate things, what countries say they do in terms of exchange rate management can be very different from what they actually do. So again, research of Federico, this time with Eduardo levice uh, showed developed a methodology about how to find out what countries really do in terms of exchange rate management and to look at the implications for growth. I mean, is one type of exchange rate regimes better for GDP growth than others? So that's about research. And as I said, I mean, Federico is going to tell us a lot more about this. Teaching. Uh, this is uh, from last year's uh, class taught by Federico uh, at HEC. Uh, unfortunately, here the, the titles are in French, but somehow, I mean, the color code should help. Uh, we may find out now, I mean, who is the one person I mean, who uh, rated the discourse not as it should be. Uh, maybe more interesting is the comments. So I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, maybe you can look at this one. I mean, overall fantastic course with great charismatic relevance. Federico is engaging, <laughs> extremely knowledgeable and funny. I mean, I, I, sorry, I'm putting it the threshold quite high for what's <laughs> coming next. Uh, very relevant course for anyone interested in the macro picture, anyone just enjoy fun. Uh, f uh, fun, lucrative anecdotes. Even though Federico would frequently postpone, ignore, forget the break midway through class. Very good, Federico. <laughs> I, uh, I commend you. I still find myself happy to just sit and listen. Then here there are some of the weak points, suggested improvements. No, give the man a pay raise. So I'm very much against that. I like that. I like that. Uh, I like and that. an excellence in teaching award. Well, we didn't do the excellence in teaching award, but we did the uh, professor honoris causa. Okay, so since second item, transmit knowledge to students. Take. Uh, <coughs> implications for companies. Well, actually, here I'm skipping. Uh, some steps in Federico's life. I mean, there, there has been I mean, a number of years where Federico he has been dean of business school. I mean, actually, I mean, uh, the partner of HEC Paris in Argentina, Ditella University. I did not try to slide about this because nobody cares about deans of business schools. So let's move <laughs> to another episode, which is CEO of Bet. So this is a case a study uh, published in a somewhat well-known uh, institution. Usually, when you see case study and you see academics, you expect the name to be here in authors. You look at authors of the case study, you don't find Federico's name. On the other hand, the, case, the name comes here in the description of the case study. So it's not a case study by Federico Schwarzenegger, it's a case study about Federico Schwarzenegger. About uh, he's taking over a bank. I mean, uh, usually we have to take, I mean, some people think of uh, academics as being uh, friendly lunatics living in the ivory tower. Well, here, I mean, uh, this gentleman uh, has been CEO of the bank, and his performance has been good enough. I mean, to, I think there is two parts to the case study. I mean, there is an A and a B uh, about HBR, and actually. One can suspect from the fact that I'm putting this slide uh, on the board, that on the screen, is that actually the performance was positive. Uh, then policy implication. Well, here again, I'm skipping another step in Federico's life. I mean, that's the problem with productive people. I mean, it's, uh, doing too many things, so that's too many slides to write for too little time. So Federico also got elected to the parliament, but uh, people care less about this than uh, about being dean of business school. So let's skip that. <laughs> and since December, uh, Federico uh, is, December, right? December. Uh, has been the uh, president of the Argentinian Central Bank. And since December, Federico managed to keep himself busy. Uh, so this is actually, uh, I think, taken from the Wall Street Journal. This one from uh, the New York Times. I mean, there has been, I mean, uh, some events taking place, uh, lifting of cap uh, capital controls, and deals about hedge funds. And often, a criticism sometimes being given about uh, teaching in business schools that sometimes uh, course material is not frequently updated. I mean, here, 
December 16, 2015, February 29, 2016. Not only it's quite current, but we are not bringing to HEC students, I mean, people who write about the events, but people who uh, have built the events. Uh, another interesting thing about this, I mean, is uh, uh, that there were expectations by journalists, by policy makers, about what would happen when some decisions were taken. Uh, particular, for, I mean, uh, the impact of the lifting of currency controls. I think Federico is going to tell us that he had different expectations from the expectations of journalists, of policy makers, uh, that those uh, expectations were deeply rooted in economic theory, that being an academic brought him a different perspective on things, and that presumably helped him uh, which, I mean, uh, better decisions. But this is the time where I think I would better stop and let Federico uh, take the floor. So a warm welcome to Federico <laughs> Chesimeo. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, this honor. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. A great student, that one, eh? Which says the pay rise. I think she should kind of, we should go back to that, okay, at some point. And, no, but it's, it's, it's a real pleasure and also seeing so many friends that uh, I've worked and interacted over the last years here at HSC. So it's uh, so really ma ma many thanks. You know, since I've become president of the Central Bank, they told me that I cannot give speeches. I have to, I have to read speeches. Because then, you know, as a president of the central bank, you have to control very well what you say. So who's controlling what I write? Okay. But anyway, so apparently, apparently, I guess if you write it, you have more time to think about it. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick to the, to the protocol and, uh, and do it that way. It's, uh, can you hear me? Is that fine? This microphone? Eh? No? This one doesn't work? Sorry. So what? Maybe then I can, we can work on this one. Is that fine? Is that better? I, ha I have some slides, yes, but uh, I'm going to use it in a little while. Okay. Thank you. Ah, yes. Just, just a little bit. Let, leave that one on. Okay, so let, let's go. So many thanks, Jax, for such kind and undeserved presentation. Over the years, both you and your wife, I think, have supported my visit at HSA with warmth, always providing a stimulating environment. And you, Jack, always sharing a growing excitement with HSS, it's unbounded, okay? So it's always a growing with HSS finance program. Congratulations as well for your recent appointment as Dean of, of Faculty at HSS. My relation with HSC dates uh, back to my time as Dean of the Business School at Universidad de Itela, which uh, Jack's already mentioned. At the time, in the late 90s, the Business School at Itela was almost a startup and not the big and prestigious university it later became once I left. Uh, for me, a key step in raising the, uh, raising the profile of the school was to have good agreements with prestigious schools abroad. Here I found the helping hand of Jean-Marc de Lesnider, I don't know if I pronounced it right, that supported our integration to the PIM network of which HSC was an important, important partner. This helped raise the school's visibility and also started a program of visiting professorships, of which I would be an example. But in the ensuing years, uh, several HSC professors visited Itela, among them Michelle Fiol, whom I remember with much affection. I have to say that I'm a bit overwhelmed by the honor conferred on me by HSC. I am not sure that I deserve it, but in my defense, I can say that my career has combined back and forth between academia, business, government, and politics that provides a unique perspective to things. Jack has already mentioned part of this. I think that it is this unique experience that HSC is honoring today. The backbone of my career has been academia, and I have taught at three universities, UCLA, Ditela, and Harvard, with regular visits at HSC. But in between these academic respites, was the moment of peace, I have been chief economist of Argentina's largest corporation, YPF. I told my students that's where I lost my hair. <laughs> a secretary of economic policy, and during the last eight years, more fully devoted to a career in public service, president of Banco Ciudad, a state-owned bank, 
member of the Chamber of Representatives, and now governor of the Central Bank of Argentina. From this personal experience, the message I want to convey today is that academia provides a framework for thinking the real world in a more provocative, challenging, and eventually correct way. It also allows to look at the data and reality beyond the cliches that tend to dominate the public debate. This is what academia is about, the possibility of actually challenging your own thoughts on an issue, and to never stop challenging yourself. When you do that, you listen more, you learn more, and you do better policies. The exercise of academia prepares you for your own demise, prepares you to accept your own mistakes, and this in turn allows you to correct them sooner. In this lecture, I want to draw on some puzzles which I confronted when analyzing two specific policy issues for which a new framework, only possible, I think, thanks to my academic training, guided academic and policy discussion in a dramatically different direction. After discussing these examples, I want to refer to how academia helped me tackle some important decisions in my new role as governor of the Central Bank of Argentina. My final words will be on the role of values in shaping good policy. So let me start with the first example, which has to do with one of the two topics that uh, Jack mentioned, which is exchange rate regimes. The first case in question has to do with the discussion of exchange rate regimes. We all know this is a key issue in international finance, an issue that goes back to the memorable contribution of Robert Mandel on optimal currency areas, a contribution that later gained him the Nobel Prize in economics. According to Mandel, a fixed exchange rate facilitates transactions between countries in the same way that people in a city use the same currency rather than each having its own currency. But allowing that ease of transactions come at a cost, comes at a cost of precluding an adjustment mechanism between countries, a moving exchange rate. In a world with perfectly flexible prices, it would not make any difference if the exchange rate moves or not. But in a world where with rigid prices, this may have implications on the abilities of an economy to adjust to real shocks. The theory of optimal currency areas led to a rich empirical literature on the relative cost of foregoing this adjustment mechanism, and at the same time, on trying to understand if other adjustment mechanisms, such as fiscal transfers, labor market flexibility, or concentration of trade, matter for the trade-off. Of course, a corollary of, corollary of this literature is the extremely prolific work on the issue of currency unions. Well, I guess no better place than Europe to discuss this literature now that we carry euros and not French francs in our pockets. As the Bretton Woods system broke down in the early 1970s, the IMF started collecting data on exchange rate regimes. You may remember, Bretton Woods was an arrangement where most countries pegged to the US dollar, and the US dollar pegged to gold. By early 1973, the US had stopped pegging gold, but other countries continued to peg to the US dollar until Tired of an extremely inflationary US policy, Switzerland first, and then Japan and Germany allowed their currencies to go relative to the dollar. Or better said, they allowed the dollar to go as the US currency depreciated sharply vis-a-vis -vis these currencies. Anyway, the point is that after the collapse of Bretton Woods, the, Woods, the world started experiencing a multiplicity of exchange rate regimes. While most countries continued to peg, some countries started to float, while other countries move to a middle ground, not sustaining a fixed parity, but neither allowing the exchange rate to fully float. Some countries, not many, had dual exchange rates, splitting some trade into an official exchange rate market with the remainder trading in a separate black market. Well, nothing particularly noticeable here, except that some interesting questions started to emerge. What is better for a country? Is it better to have a fixed exchange rate or a floating exchange rate regime? Does the answer depend on the country? If so, on what characteristics of the country? Is any particular regime better suited to fight against inflation? What exchange rate regime should an open economy pursue? And so on and so on. As you can see, a new important chapter opened in international finance. Initially, this is after the breakdown of Bretton Woods, the literature focused on understanding how the new floating exchange rates were determined. 
even on this simple question, new challenges emerged as international financial capital flows revived in the 1970s after decades being dormant, bringing to the forefront the discussion of issues such as overshooting of exchange rates, the monetary approach to exchange rate portfolio balance, theories of exchange rates, and so on. But to make a long story short, as countries started finding their true regime, the literature moved to the discussion of the implications of these different regimes. Yet the empirical literature was unable to render significant results. In the data, it seemed no distinguishable pattern could be identified when comparing fixed and floating regimes. In short, much ado about nothing, could read the conclusion. Even by 1997, in their paper, Fixing Exchange Rates, a Virtual Quest for Fundamentals, Robert Flood and Andrew Rose argued that there was no relation between exchange rate regimes and macroeconomic variables. So all this fuss about changing exchange rate regimes, but it all seemed to be concoded in some politician's mind with no real relevance in the real world. Of course, there continued to be lots of research on the trade impact of exchange rate regimes, eventually on target zones, but the state of the art by the mid 1990s did not produce statistical results on the relevance of regimes. Thus, the discussion of the optimality of exchange rate regimes seemed to be more associated to fads rather than to empirical conclusions. In the 1990s, for example, there was a fad with convertibility regimes such as that implemented in Argentina. Much later in the 1997 with the Asian crisis, Australia's floating dollar become, became the star of the day, and so on. A first glimpse that this could change was a paper by Gosch, Gulde, Austria, and Wolf, Does the exchange rate regime matter for inflation and growth, which studied the impact of exchange rate regimes on inflation. Just looking at the countries that the IMF considered fixed exchange rate regimes, it was easy to see that there was as many high as low inflation countries. Gosch and co-authors immediately realized this and suggested a distinction between true and non-true peggers. To what extent a country that modifies its fixed exchange rate regularly should be considered a fixed regime? In the extreme, a country could change its fixed rate every day. This should certainly not be considered a fixed rate regime. Gosh et al. then show that if you claim to have a peg and lived up to your promise, then with certainty you had a lower inflation rate. This work motivated me and my colleague Eduardo Levi Shechati to build a completely new classification of exchange rate regimes, but not one that relied on the regime countries claimed to be running, which is what one could find in the IMF classification, but one that relied on what countries were doing. Thus, we created a de facto exchange rate classification to be compared with the IMF classification, which we called the de jure classification. The classification was built using cluster analysis that identified common patterns between three variables, the movements in the exchange rate, the movements in reserves, and the movements in the rate of change of the exchange rate. This to identify crawling pegs that depreciate at a constant steady rate. In this classification method, countries whose exchange rate did not move when reserves did were classified as fixers, while countries where the exchange rate moved a lot and reserves did not were classified as float. But it was the data that did the sorting. We presented this classification and some preliminary results at an IMF conference in Washington, D.C. in 2001. In that paper, we looked at the effect of de facto regimes on inflation, output growth, and volatility, as well as on other macro variables. Later on, in a follow-up paper published in the American Economic Review, we investigated specifically growth performance of fixed and floating regimes. We concluded that GDP in floating regime countries tended to grow faster and with lower volatility. As you can see, some result started to emerge from the data. Later on, in a paper published in the European Economic Review, we linked exchange rate regime's choice to country characteristics. Here, Mandel's theory started to show up clearly. Larger countries tended to float, countries with more concentrated trade tended to fix, and so on. In following years, a large literature developed on the basis of this simple idea. Not only because lots of empirical work was done using the de facto exchange rate classification, but because new classifications also emerged. Among them 
one that became, also became very popular was done by Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt. In fact, so radical was the change in paradigm that some years later, the IMF dropped publication of its de jure classification and moved to its own version of de facto regimes. The point of this story is to emphasize how a simple idea can open a completely new way of thinking about an issue. In this case, we could not understand how regimes worked and what were their effects, but we could not understand this because we were not looking where we had to look, or we were not looking the way we should look. Yet, once we learned how to look, we were able to see that regimes really mattered. The other story I want to mention has to do with a debate, and Jack also referred to this as well, to a debate the world entertained about 10 years ago. The debate referred to what at the time was known as global imbalances. Global imbalances referred to the fact that large economies experienced either large current account deficit or large current account surpluses. The current account of a country measures how much the country is building or depleting its foreign assets. Japan, for example, is known for its persistent current account surpluses. This means it is an economy that is piling up foreign assets. When you do that, it means you are consuming less than what you produce. This bodes well with the frugality of the Japanese. On the other hand, the US economy has been running current account deficits since the early 1980s. In other words, the US economy has become, I'll show the slide in a minute. In other words, the US economy has become an increasing debtor with the rest of the world. <coughs> there is no problem with being a debtor or a creditor, or particularly a debtor, as long as your debt remains sustainable. But by mid-2000, mid, um, the world got convinced that the situation was unsustainable. The US current account deficit by 2006 was close to 6% of GDP and had been running at very high levels for many years. And this is the first slide that I want to show you. No? So this is the US current account uh, deficit or the US current account balance as a percentage of GDP. So imagine we're in 2006. So this is the graph we would have seen in 2006. And you just see a country which is running a growing and growing and growing current account deficit, very large and a very large economy. And this means that there's the rest of the world is financing the US at the tune of 6% of its GDP per year. Was the US economy heading towards a crisis? Let's review three views at the time. So quote number one, in our view, any sober policymaker or financial market or financial market analyst ought to regard the US current account deficit as a sword of Damocles hanging over the global economy. This is Maurice Opsfeld and Ken Rogoff, 2005. Second quote, the current account deficit will continue to grow on the back of higher and higher payments of US foreign debt, even if the trade deficit stabilizes. That is why sustained trade deficits will set off the kind of explosive debt dynamics that lead to financial crisis. This is Nouriel Rubini, 2005. And the last one says, the growing external deficits of the world's sole superpower have put the global economy on a path that is not merely unsustainable, but also dangerously so. This is Martin Wolf, Financial Times, 2004. Just to get an idea of what the feeling of the discussion was at the time we were entertaining the discussion. Ken Rogoff and Maurice Opsfeld anticipated a depreciation of the US dollar of about 40% at the time. But such large corrections in external imbalances, as we know from emerging economies, are never painless. And pain in the US certainly has externalities on the rest of the world. In short, there was a fairly broad consensus that the world was heading towards a large crisis. This was the state of affairs when, with my colleague Ricardo Hausmann at Harvard Kennedy School, where I was visiting professor at the time, we got intrigued by something that looked like an inconsistency. If the US economy is at the center of global imbalances, and the concern is that it is increasing its rate of indebtedness so dramatically, then we should be able to diagnose the problem when looking at the payments by the US economy to the rest of the world. There we could confirm that the US economy was mortgaging its future. If you increase your debt, 
you pay. Yet, when observing how much the US was paying for becoming the world's largest debtor, we found a paradox. What was observed in the data was that far from making payments, the US was actually being paid by the rest of the world. How could this be? Let me put this straight. What we saw was like finding a debtor that runs up its debt, but rather than paying, gets paid. And let me show it to you. So here you have the cumulative <coughs> current account deficit of the US, which is the red line, which measures the amount of total debt of the US economy at each particular point of time. And the blue line is the net income of the US from supposedly it's foreign debt, okay? At the time, nobody had paid attention to this fact, except an elliptic, elliptic reference by Bill Klein in a book called The United States, A Debtor Nation. And then it took us some time to understand what was going on and then to quantify its relevance. Let me start with what was going on. Allow me to call the first possible explanation of this puzzle non-observable trade. And the story goes like this. When Starbucks sets a shop in any country, when a software programmer from Rochester sends a solution to a colleague in Bangalore, or when Apple produces iPhones in China, the embedded knowledge or the value of the brand increase the return of those assets or activities. In some sense, this is trade that is not registered because it is trade in intangibles or trade in knowledge. The problem with our statistic is that the knowledge contained in an email does not fit in any export category. If we were to count them as an export, we would have more of them and we would have seen a much smaller current account deficit and the puzzle would not have been there. In recent BIS, BIS meetings, we have discussed the relatively little increase in trade flows or how little trade flows have reacted in recent years to economic recovery. But for me, it is a measure of the different nature of trade today as we had already identified 10 years ago. This export of knowledge implies that the return of foreign assets becomes larger and that in spite of a current account deficit, there is no increase in foreign payments because the return differential compensates the increase in the levels of debt. A second source of this return differential between assets abroad for US residents and assets that foreigners hold in the US is insurance. The US economy is considered, considered a relatively safe economy and thus the world is happy to swap US assets earning a low rate of return for high risky assets abroad earning a higher rate of return. This will imply a return differential but this is an equilibrium return because it works as if the rest of the world pays an insurance premium to the US. Again, this explains the difference in the return that foreigners earn on their returns to the US and what US residents earn on their returns abroad. We later discovered that another country with similar insurance returns is Switzerland. A recent review of this issue can be found in a paper by Helen Ray and co-authors. The final source explaining the discrepancy between the current account deficit and the lack of net payments on external debt is seniorage. When Ecuador decides to use US dollars as currencies, it has to buy its currency with real exports, bananas, for example. So that you have to use bananas to buy pieces of paper. So the US can run a deficit and never have to pay for it considering the half the stock of US currency is abroad, it is clear that there is something here. Though quantitatively, we found later this to be of minor importance relative to the other two. The truth of the matter is that for any of these reasons, we have a mismeasurement problem. So we decided to provide a new estimate of US foreign assets by applying a price earnings ratio to the US net earnings on its net foreign assets. This is a very simple computation and one, common, and one very common in basic finance. You can't see the asset. You don't have a price for the asset. Just tell me how, the asset, how much the asset makes and multiply it by a multiple. We can discuss then what multiple to use. So we just did that 
and came up with a new measure of US foreign assets. So we took the earning stream and we multiplied by a multiple and we got a new estimate. We call the difference between this new estimate and official numbers dark matter. Not only because I'm a Star Wars fan, okay? Playing with, playing with an analogy to astronomy. When astronomers look into galaxies, they cannot justify the gravitational pull that would keep them together just from observed matter. So they infer that there has to be unobserved matter that they call dark matter. Here the analogy reveals itself evident. There are assets we cannot see, but we see their earning power. So our idea was to infer the value of the assets from their earning power. So the computations, you take this number. This is for my students also, which will have to do it later in the take home. So you take, you take the earning power, you multiply by a multiple, you get a new estimate of the assets, and you subtract it from the official number, and you get an estimate of dark matter. These are the hidden assets that the US economy has and that we couldn't see. In this particular case, when we computed this in 2006, that was about $7 trillion. The problem, or the paradox, was that this earning power had been increasing over the last 20 years. You saw it in the previous slide. So our conclusion was that the US had increased its net foreign assets. Remember, the assets were just a multiple of the earnings. And as the current account is the change in foreign assets, our conclusion is that the US had accumulated foreign assets, not foreign debt. In fact, what we were saying was that the US current account actually did not even exist. Later on in my life, I got used to attacks in the political arena. But I have to confess that at the time, I was not prepared for the attacks we received for this idea. Not many people in academia took nicely the fact that we were just saying that everything they had been discussing for the last five years did not even exist. Not happy at all, OK? The debate ran different ways across the Atlantic. At the same time, we were slaughtered by the European Economist, the Economist magazine, and the Financial Times. The Financial Times actually set up a website to discuss this issue. While we were praised by the American Wall Street Journal and Business Week. The Wall Street Journal, actually in the editorial, recommended the congressman to, write the paper, to read the paper because it spoke better of, of the American economy at a moment where everybody was thinking that the American economy was heading towards a crisis. In our academia, the debate lingered on, and the most simple criticism was that dark matter was a temporary phenomenon, and that quick enough it would reverse, and the crude reality of the US economy weaknesses would become self-evident. In the meantime, we spent our time computing dark matter for all countries in the world, UK, Switzerland, and the US were the largest owners of dark matter assets. Ireland and Singapore, recipients of FDI, had large negative stocks of dark matter, and so on. The debate continued until a few years later, it was taken over by the financial crisis of 2008. At the end of the day, global imbalances never triggered a crisis. And in this way, we were vindicated. And to finish, let me say, that that market continued to grow. So sorry. Let's see. Ah. ah, here it is. So here you have dark matter until 2015. Remember the previous graph was until 2006? I said this is just a fluke, and it's going to fall down. By 2015, the US economy had continued accumulating a dark matter. Again, looking at things in a provocative and novel way paved the way to a better understanding of the situation. In this second example, the world was ringing the bell on a crisis that was not going to occur and that never occurred. Both these exercises have one thing in common. They encourage you to think out of the box, to resist conventional wisdom, to challenge your own assumptions, to look at things in different ways. I can, I'm sorry about this. I cannot but remember that wonderful moment in the first of the Star Wars movies. When Obi-Wan Kenobi tells a young Luke Skywalker, don't believe your eyes, they deceive you. 
Okay, so, so let me move on now. You, you have to know all the Star Wars quotes, okay? So let me move on now to another example of how this provocative way of thinking can help you in policy. And let me fast forward into one of the most dramatic policy measures we had to take in Argentina and that I was responsible to make just four days after taking office as governor of the Central Bank. As you know, there have recently been elections in Argentina. The new president had campaigned on the basis of eliminating the main restrictions that were holding back our country, which had not seen growth for about four years. The most important of these restrictions were capital and exchange rate controls. A misguided policy had imagined that you could contain inflation by pegging the exchange rate below its equilibrium level. The result had been a per pervasive real appreciation of the currency, and as export collapsed, the need to impose exchange rate controls rose. At the end, the economy came to a halt. Of course, immediately, a black market exchange rate developed. Let's take a look. So this was the official rate in Argentina, and this was the black market exchange rate where you could get your currency uh, more freely, even though it was illegal. Okay? So you couldn't speak about this market in Argentina. So the campaign promise was to get rid of this system that had reduced the productivity of the economy. Yet, could it be done? If you allow the exchange rate to go, where will it find its equilibrium value? If transactions had been contained for so many years, what kind of jump would follow a liberalization? These issues took center stage during the political campaign of 2015. Economists on one side or the other took turns to give an opinion. The great majority thought it between mildly to totally insane to think about releasing exchange rate controls overnight. All thought it was insane. The discussion reminded me of, of a famous Erhard Quo anecdote. Ludwig Erhard was the finance minister of Germany in the immediate post-war period. So this is the Erhard anecdote. In 1948, Ludwig Erhard was about to free exchange rate and price controls in a war-torn war, war Germany with pervasive shortages. The day, the day before his move, the US General Clay, commander in chief of Allied forces in occupied Germany, called Erhard to a meeting and questioned him. Mr. Erhard, all of my advisors say you are going to liberalize markets in one scoop and that you are totally insane. What can you say about that? It is said that Erhard calmly replied, well, General, I think you should not worry. My advisors agree. <laughs> So here comes the out-of-the-box thinking. I want, you to, I want you to look at the current account of Argentina. Take a look. So this is, this is the current account. You have the period, uh, the 1990s. You had a current account deficit. But then, all throughout the 2000s, Argentina had a current account surplus. The graph at the end, you had a little bit more of a balance, a little bit of a deficit. But you can see the very large surpluses that we had during the 2000s. The graph is interesting because it shows that during the last decade, Argentina ran mostly a current account surplus. This means that during this period, it accumulated foreign assets. So when looking at this graph, it was clear that if anything, Argentines had an excess of dollars, not of pesos, and that they would get rid of them as soon as conditions changed. That, this is what convinced me that we could move from this regime to a freer system without much turmoil. <laughs> This, in fact, is what happened. Take a look. So this is when we freed the exchange rate, and then the system converged to somehow of an intermediate level. Around there, immediately, and over time, the two, the two curves converged. I was actually in the country. Nobody knows if we devalued the currency or if we appreciated the currency. Because certainly, officially, the official exchange rate devalue but many transactions will be doing at the black market exchange rate, and that appreciated. No? It was thinking about the overall equilibrium of the economy that convinced us that we could actually liberalize the constraints. But not many people looked at it that way. Yet this graph would be the first thing we, should have, we would have shown to our students in a class. 
So again, never stop having a fresh look at things. Let me clarify before closing on this and, and closing overall, that this does not mean that conventional wisdom is always wrong. I am just saying that what is wrong is not to challenge conventional wisdom. Let me conclude with a final thought. What I've talked about here has to do with what has to be done or about how to learn what has to be done. But in politics, there is an additional dimension, which is that you need people that will want to do what needs to be done. It is important to distinguish what has to be done as it is to have the will. It's, 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 it's as important to, this, to know what has to be done as it is to have the willingness to pursue those objectives. The main lesson from my policy experience is that policy has to work on the trade-offs between the interest of the public good of the population at large and its confrontation with interest of concentrated groups. Mankur also, in his monumental The Logic of Collective Action back in the 1960s, noted this trade-off. He used to talk about the sugar industry in the US. In the 1960s, when he was writing, the sugar industry had managed to obtain sugar quotas that put the wholesale price of sugar five times the international price. This is in the US, of course. This implied a little extra cost for millions of US families, but millions for a few large industries. What did Olson say? Well, that while those who had millions at stake would fight hardly to keep those privileges, those who were hurt by those privileges had individually very little to lose. So they could not organize their collective action, at least around this issue. At the end, concentrated interest prevailed. My experience has taught me that this is also center fault to good policies. And in order to take the correct way, the ingredient or the key ingredient is or are your values. It's to understand that in policy, you are there as a public servant to defend the public good and that this will imply a never-ending battle with concentrated interest. And it implies that you will be alone in the fight because the diluted benefits you can obtain for the population at large will not motivate the population to rally in your support, whereas the privileges that you take away from a few will generate an angry and significant response. I could give you many examples. When we transformed Banco Ciudad from a money-losing institution into the most profitable state-owned company in Argentina, which is the reason why they wrote the case. It was big, and the day they came to do the thing, there were tires being burned in the basement, so anyway. So um, it was because we understood that the assets were allocated in low yield, yielding central bank paper, which was good for the government and for the managers of the bank, which did not have to take any responsibility, but very bad for the population at large that had market access curtailed by the use of this fund, or by this use of these funds. When we implemented an open access to job positions in the bank, we had many strikes by employees that wanted their sons, sons and daughters to have privileged access. And a couple of years ago, when the previous government passed a hydrocarbon law that provided big incentives to oil companies, it was difficult to generate any general reaction against it. Thus, at the end of the day, academia can help you and can help us understand the way. But you will need the aid of your values to trot down the path. Well, with that, I finish. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, Olivier, thanks, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the honor. have been made uh, for the future of the country. A change of uh, policy regarding the currency, so what I could call a liberal shock, uh, takes some adjustment time for the economy to adapt, and especially for the local industries. 
And so in the past, we learned that adjustment means a lot of suffering for um, people working, uh, as imports do compete better than, than local products. How do you balance this wheel of consensus of the new government and the painful experience that a liberal shock may drive for the Argentinian economy and the people? Well, you, you bring up a, a very interesting question which has to do with the political equilibrium in Argentina. Let me, let me give, uh, tell you the following. Um, the current president was mayor of the city of Buenos Aires for eight years. And for eight years, uh, we never had a majority in the legislature, in the city legislature. So our political party grew the exercise of being in politics without having a majority in its Congress. So we learned the exercise of building consensus, of listening, of changing your views, of taking into account the view of others. And this is a fairly unique experience in Argentina, because I would say that in Argentina, the, the problem we've had with, uh, with our politics is that governments have had too much ability to do. You wake up one morning, and the country has changed completely. Because the whole political system aligns itself. There's a change in preferences. And then someone is sworn as president. And the whole political system aligns behind that president. When the US Constitution was uh, done, I think the whole idea of the US Constitution was to, have, to make it difficult to change things. So we have an executive, we have a Congress, and the Congress will have two chambers. And uh, so the president will have to ask for permission. And if these guys got together, then you had the Supreme Court. And th there was a, a sense of doing that, which is that in order to generate stability in a society, you need things to be built as a collective undertaking. And for that, you need institutions that provide check and balances. I think the problem in Argentina and in our, in our history I think you, I wouldn't associate it to any specific name, to any specific government, but it has to be, of course, if you have a problem for 60 years, there's an underlying structural thing that has to explain it, and has been the imbalance of our political system. So we've always had a, a political party which was very preeminent, which was the Peronist Party, which perhaps in one decade was a free market party, and then another decade was exactly the opposite, so it didn't have any specific ideology, but it really did have control of power. So the problem is that when they governed, you did, had very little checks and balances. And then you had a lot of instability because the scope for doing policy was very big. And when the opposition was governing, then you always had kind of this other political party which really constrained uh, its, uh, its possibilities. And therefore, neither one nor the other worked really very well. Something very special happened in this election. Uh, this is something, of course, that you wouldn't know about because it's very specific to Argentina. But we not only won the national election, and we won the city of Buenos Aires, but our party won the province of Buenos Aires, which is what 40% of the people live. And that has basically generated, for the first time in Argentina, a relatively even political situation with the Pro party and Cambiemos as a coalition eh, on one side and the Peronist party on the other side. And no one has full power. For example, we control the House of Representatives, or we have a majority in the House of Representatives, and the Peronism has full control of that or has majority in the Senate. And I think that is extraordinarily positive, positive for Argentina because that will generate stability and that will generate the necessity that the policies that have to be implemented have to be, you have to bring everybody on the table. That means that many things you won't do, many things that you thought you wanted to do, maybe, you don't, maybe, maybe society was not ready for them. Now, once you actually get everybody together in doing something, that becomes very stable, because everybody has been part of the agreement. So, and I would say that in, ad, in addition to whatever happens on the economic front in, with, uh, with the current government in Argentina, if what emerges from this presidency is a political system which is more balanced, I think that would be the, the biggest legacy and the most enduring contribution that Mauricio Macri can do to Argentina. Because the problem has been the imbalance of the political system. So, so I think you have a process going on, 
where thing has to be discussed, everybody has be, had to be brought to the table, and that basically helps resolve the, the dilemma you were presenting in your question. So that, that would be my, my answer. We have time for our last question because we are running a bit late. Otherwise, I mean, we can move to the ceremony part, the granting the, the actual diploma. Anyone? No, so then. Okay, perfect. Okay, so maybe. Okay, so I'm supposed to open it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. I must say that I'm, I'm sure that there are official words I'm supposed to pronounce. No, 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 no. Uh, because I'm new on my job, I don't know them. Just give it to me, no? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, let me grant you the, this uh, Diploma of Professor Honoris Causa from HEC Paris. Thank you so much. <laughs>